very much. Uh, I greatly appreciated the uh, invite. Well, I saw the email months ago. Uh, I'd already lectured to a DTC at Imperial two years ago, so I was anticipating another trip to South Kensington. Uh, but then I realised that uh, you'd our next Aberyst with. Uh, particularly pleased to uh, come back to the land of my fathers. Apparently, all the other lecturers have uh, spoken in English so far, is that right? I think you're mixing it up a bit. <laughs> The only thing I'll say about that is on the handout you sent out to people, you said, here's a typical bit of Welsh that actually was Irish, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll stick to English. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, in my uh, three slots this morning, uh, uh, I'll start off uh, talking about experiments with code. So I'm an experimentalist, uh, so I'll have an experimental uh, flavour for all of the talks. Uh, I'll talk about some experiments with code patterns first. Uh, I'll give you an overview. I realize there are people here with different backgrounds. Uh, some of you might have seen a bit of this before, so please bear with me. Some of you might not have seen it all. Um, by the end of the first session, I also want to tell you about some uh, up-to-date recent things we're doing at Durham. Then the uh, second slot, uh, I'll talk about another um, code pattern experiment uh, I do at Durham. And then the third slot will be slightly different. Uh, some uh, underlying themes for all three slots this morning, so I'll try and emphasize those as we go along. Okay, so for the first one, uh, this is essentially the biggest underlying theme. Uh, there are two types of atom light interactions, so I'll spend some time discussing that and I'll come back to that uh, more than once this morning. Uh, Lizard Cooley revolutionized atomic physics. For those of us who are old enough to remember the days before Lizzie Cooling, uh, it really is uh, quite a dramatic change. Uh, so I'll tell you quickly how that works. And the real emphasis is on scratching how that is, uh, how we do that, what techniques we have. And also this idea of uh, why has all this revolutionized atomic physics. So Making things go slower has clearly made it <coughs> easier, but actually that's not really the main theme. Uh, the main theme is when I was an undergraduate, there was a whole host of experiments uh, which started with this statement, sort of, take an atom, let's do something. Uh, and they were thought experiments. So typically uh, you could have a heated debate about what might happen, uh, and then you moved on because no one had actually done these experiments. So somehow the biggest message from this first this morning is a whole host of things that were consigned basically to the last lecture of a lecture course or the end of the textbook because actually um, there wasn't any experimental evidence for or against. That's now been completely changed and a whole host of experiments are being done uh, based on the advances we've seen earlier. So as I said I'll talk about some particular uh, aspects that we're up to in Durham for that. So As I said, I'm an experimentalist, so uh, I don't have too many equations, I have more pictures. So this is my picture of uh, monochromatic light interacting with an atom. And essentially, uh, all we need to know is that the atom is neutral, we displace the electron in the electric field, that makes a dipole, the dipole then radiates, and all we have to do is add the electric field in the forward direction, and we can calculate how the light propagates through this medium with atoms. So atoms are driven at one frequency, they have to radiate at that frequency. So actually there are two numbers that you want to characterize how strong the interaction is at some level. So we know that the waves have to carry on the same frequency. So the two numbers are the amplitude, <laughs> So uh, the two numbers that characterize uh, these waves are their amplitude and their phase. Uh, if we know those two numbers, then we essentially uh, can characterize the amplitude direction. The easiest way to do it is in fact to think of these two numbers as one complex number. Uh, so this is a theme that will recur uh, this morning, that we can think of the atom having a susceptibility, <coughs> the medium composed of atoms as having a refractive index. 
the refractive index is complex. So there's the real part of the refractive index, which tells us about slurry depth. There's the imaginary part of the refractive index, and that tells us about absorption. So these are two very different atom light interactions, but they're intricately linked. So some of you might have come across these formidable looking equations. So we don't know, need to know the details, we just need to know the exist. They're known as the Kramers Crawley equations. And they're crucial. So what this tells you is often in an experiment, you try and design some interaction in order to make your device work better. And you often say, well, it would be nice if the absorption had this shape. And then you're tempted to say, and the refractive index did that. And that's where it all starts going wrong. So what Kramers Kronig tells you is if you know what the absorption profile is, if you were to do this integral, you could then calculate the refractive index at all frequencies. Or if you've designed some kind of device and you know what the refractive index does, so if you know how the refractive index behaves as a function of frequency, were you to do that integral, you get the absorption. In other words, you can't just arbitrarily make up the medium whose absorption and refractive index do what you want. And these are phenomenally general, the Kramers Corning equations. They don't just hold for atoms, they hold for op amps. Any black box, in fact, that has an input and an output are some kind of Kramers Corning equations. And they're very general because they essentially come from causality the idea that the output can't leave before the input has actually triggered some event. So although dispersion and absorption are, are different aspects of the atom light interaction, we have to bear in mind that they're intricately linked. So changes to one have concomitant change to the other. For the laser cooling part, the other uh, phenomenon we need is the Compton effect. So the more dramatic uh, way to do the Compton effect is as Compton himself did in the 20s, you get X-rays and you bounce them off very light particles like electrons. And the electron shoots off in one direction and the X-ray shoots off in another direction. And you've probably all done this calculation as first year undergraduates. You can then calculate what the change in the wavelength is as a function of the angle. And essentially all you have to do is write down conservation of energy and momentum. And that actually, well, clearly that's trivial. However, at the time, historically, uh, this was uh, quite a major breakthrough because some people had started thinking that conservation of energy and momentum were bulk properties. It didn't have to apply to an individual binary encounter. So by binary encounter, I mean the two simple quanta, so light and an electron. And Compton showed by mapping out this dependence that in fact, you know, conservation of momentum and energy happens for every binary encounter. So if you write down some simple equations about that, you realize that if the x-ray goes off in another direction, to conserve energy and momentum, this particle has to change its speed. Mm -hmm. So the change of speed, I'm going to call it a recoil. Now the effect is dramatic for x-rays because uh, the energy is large and the mass is small. We're going to do laser cooling where we use optical photons where the energy is smaller. And we're going to try and slow down atoms whose mass is heavier. But you still get a noticeable effect. The key thing is this idea that even for binary encounters, all you have to do is conserve energy and momentum and the recoil pops out. Uh, so, if you've not heard this before, you might think that something's gone wrong because laser cooling sounds like a contradiction. So if you type in lasers into Google, we all know what lasers are good for. Cutting, welding, melting, winding. So that's the kind of picture you have. So lasers are clearly so I remember when I started my um, PhD, I made the mistake of telling my family uh, that I was working with a laser beam uh, and an atomic beam. I might as well have told them I was working with death rays. <laughs> That's essentially uh, you know, the picture people have. So it's terrible. Uh, so clearly we don't want to do that. So all we have to recall is, so if we want to cool things, we want to reduce the temperature. Temperatures are the of the atom's speed. So, were we to be able to create a frictional force, we'd then be able to slow down atoms. If we slow atoms down, their momentum dispersion is smaller, that's what cooling actually is. So how do we do that? So there are three key concepts, uh, all of which
which you've seen independently, you've probably seen them together, but if not, I'll go through this quickly. So radiation pressure, the Doppler effect, and resonance, and when we combine those three, we can actually make this incredibly strong prediction. So how does that look? So radiation pressure is the idea, again, historically, this was quite contentious. Maxwell thought light carried momentum, but uh, other people disagreed. So now we think of light as carrying momentum. Atoms can absorb light, so if the light disappears, or at least changes direction, how do I conserve momentum? The atom has a weak one. So we can transfer momentum from light to atoms, and this is radiation pressure. So at a more sort of atomic level, if we think of two level atoms starting in the ground state, we shine in some light, so a photon comes along, momentum H back here. If the photon disappears, the atom jumps into the excited state. So to conserve energy, we're happy that the uh, energy of the photon is now stored in the atom. So there clearly has to be conservation of momentum. So given that the photon has disappeared, the atom has to jump off in this <coughs> direction. Excited atoms tend to radiate every sort of 10 ish nanoseconds. The direction of that can be uh, random, essentially. So you get another kick when you fall back. But then this is the magic of laser cooling for atoms. You then end up back in a ground state where we can go round and round this circle. This is why this process tends not to work terribly well for molecules, because you have a whole forest of states down here. And the molecule can fall into, you're not back on resonance. For a clause two level system, round and round this circle we go. And the kick you get each time isn't terribly impressive. So the change in speed is, well, for a sort of typical atom in the middle of the periodic table, you get about a centimetre per second, which isn't that large. However, because we can go round and round and scatter um, 10 million of these photons per second, we clearly can get a huge rate of change of momentum, which is the force we need uh, to bring atoms to rest. So what does the Doppler effect come into this? So typically for laser cooling, we use uh, one beam going to the right, one beam going to the left, equal intensity, equal frequency. We consider what happens if you have a moving atom. So the atom runs into beam R, so it clearly sees these peaks more often, so it experiences a higher frequency. So the atom is running away from beam L, so it sees those peaks less often, so it experiences a lower frequency. And then resonance, so... Uh, as I had that little picture earlier of an atom as a oscillating charge, uh, any mechanical system uh, has a resonant frequencies. So around the resonant frequency, there's some kind of symmetric shape, which tells you essentially the uh, scattering rate. And if you're on resonance, you get a large atomic interaction. If you're off resonance, you get a small atomic interaction. And then for optical molasses, which is the simplest kind of this cooling, uh, in one dimension it works very simply, just like this. So I have my two laser beams, so I get one frequency, I split it into two pairs, I counter-propagate them, and I consider an atom initially at rest. And the slightly counterintuitive thing is, where do I pack my laser frequency? I don't tune it on resonance, I tune it off resonance to the low energy of the spectrum, about halfway of this thing, essentially. So as I've sketched it there, the right beam will push the atom to the right, left beam will push the atom to the left, they're equal and opposite, nothing happens, they cancel. <coughs> so that's another magic of laser cooling. So once you've made the atoms cold, although you're illuminating them with light, they don't actually move. And where does the friction come? So if I consider now an atom moving to the left, this is where the Doppler effect kicks in. So an atom moving to the left experiences a higher frequency from beam R, so it fits closer to resonance. It experiences a lower frequency from beam L, it goes further from resonance, and now I've got an imbalance. The imbalance means the atom is moving towards beam R, and it experiences a higher force. So this is a force that's dependent on the direction in which I move. Clearly, if I drew this whole thing, mirror inverted, an atom moving to the left would experience a force to the right. So this is a force which opposes motion, that's friction, and friction is what I need to um, dissipate. So a very, very quick summary of uh, Doppler cooling is in one dimension, you have two laser beams, equal frequency, equal intensity. You tune the frequency of the laser to be slightly shy of the resonant frequency. And if we then plot the force as a function of velocity, we essentially get the derivative of some line chip, which looks like this. So the force is linearly proportional to the velocity around zero velocity. At 
zero, it's zero. So atoms at rest remain at rest. That's a key feature. And um, you also have this phenomenally steep uh, damping coefficient, which is hard to um, convey into um, <coughs> magnitude on a sketch. But essentially, uh, for a typical atom, a typical laser you might find in your lab, it's trivial to obtain decelerations of 10 to the minus g, which means you can start with a hot oven with some atoms, uh, like strontium, and then 50 centimeters later, so they start off moving at the speed of a jungle jet, and then 50 centimeters later, they're at rest. As I've described it, there's, there's clearly a flaw in the theory I've just told you, because if you solve the equation x is proportional to minus v, your velocity would um, tend to zero. If all the atoms have a zero velocity, uh, I'd have zero Kelvin, which clearly breaks quite a few laws of thermodynamics. So what does that go wrong? So in fact, what I've described is the average force. You recall when I said the atom can jump out of the excited state in random directions. So I average over that. But actually, once the atoms are cold, this discrete kick they get from each photon they absorb and emit makes them move around in exactly the same way as Brownian motion. So if you look at a little particle it gets up first and it sort of does a random walk, well that's actually what atoms are in momentum. So in, for three-dimensional cooling all I need is three pairs of laser beams, so typically uh, up, down, left, right, um, emit. You get into some kind of equilibrium when the laser cooling exactly balances this Brownian heat. Uh, <coughs> look at um, all the factors that go into that, you can a very elegant result that the lower temperature, Kt, is equal to H bar, which is another fundamental constant, and gamma, which is the line width. So for any given atom, all you need to know is its line width, and you can calculate how cold um, it will get. Uh, and again, rubidium is a typical uh, alkaline metal uh, that most experimentalists will choose. Uh, and you get these ridiculously low temperatures of the order of uh, hundreds of micro Kelvin. Um, so if there's a six order, six orders of magnitude reduction uh, in kinetic energy from room temperature, which is clearly dramatic. As I said, when the field started, lots of people were excited just by the fact that these things were now moving slowly because the Doppler broadening had also reduced. Uh, I'll try to show you the rest of this talk, but it isn't just the fact that they're going slow, which is the key. Uh, just in case you haven't seen uh, it, cooling on a tank, it looks something like this. So it sounds simple in my picture, all you have are two laser beams, maybe um, in three pairs. You actually need quite a lot of uh, delegate control over the exact frequency of the laser. Uh, so there's a whole lot of lasers that we spend a lot of time uh, aligning and getting to work well. Uh, there's a vacuum chamber because clearly um, these cold atoms, if they interact with any warm things, they instantly um, heat up in the boil. So that's bad. So we have to maintain vacuum. Uh, there's a whole lot of electronics which keeps everything running well. Oops, so these, there's a computer that sits at the back that usually runs the whole experiment. Uh, and obviously, the key thing missing from my diagram is uh, some of you, some students, not to uh, do the hard work. So back to this theme, there are two types of white forces. So what I've described so far is the scattering force. So the idea that uh, beams of photons come along, atoms can absorb them and scatter them, and as a consequence, change their speed. And that's associated with uh, the imaginary part of the traffic index. However, there's the real part of the traffic index. We get something else called the dipole force associated with that. So the scattering force, uh, is dissipative, which is phenomenally useful for cooling. So you can lose energy by using the scattering force. And the simplest picture is in terms of cycles of I absorb and jump into the excited state, and then I can spontaneously emit and fall back to the ground state. So in laser cooling, there's somehow a slightly uh, dichotomous relationship with spontaneous emission. So spontaneous emission is really good at this stage because it allows us to make things cold. Once things are cold, the last thing you want is spontaneous emission, because at some level then that represents coupling to the environment, and that's going to ruin some coherencies that you probably established very quickly. This scattering force has a Lorentzian line shape, and it scales as the intensity of your laser divided by the detail of resonance squared, which we'll come back to again at the top. So um, it typically looks like that. So this is this width gamma, the resonant frequency will be not. What's the 
dipole force. So the dipole force is conservative. So it doesn't dissipate energy. So I can't use it to cool things down in a naive way. But it's phenomenally useful once things are cold, because then I can hold on to them. So the scattering force, the very simple picture is I absorb a photon, and then I fall back to the ground state. So given that I have to come back in order to go around and round that cycle, how can I uh, have another force? So the origin of the dipole force is, is cycles again, but I absorb one photon, and rather than wait for it to fall back to the ground state, I need another beam, essentially, or another wave vector to stimulate back to the ground state. So it cycles of absorption, stimulated emission, absorption, stimulated emission. So the absence of spontaneous emission is good because it means there's no dip. So this now has a dispersion line shape because it's proportional to the other component of the refractive index. And it scales as 1 over d2 min, not 1 over d2 min squared. So this is the gradient of the intensity. So there's this slightly bizarre property that for a plane wave, if I have a plane wave going in this <coughs> direction, I will clearly push atoms in that direction using the scattering force. If I have a plane wave going in this direction, there is no gradient of an intensity of a plane wave. So there is no dipole force. <coughs> so for a dipole force, a plane wave won't give, basically, there aren't enough momentum vectors, because if I absorb a photon from this beam and stimulate back into that beam, <coughs> the net effect is zero for the light, so the atom can't recoil. If I had two laser beams going in different directions, I could absorb this part of the cycle from one and emit into the other. Then I can imagine making some kind of a little triangle as a net change of momentum. <coughs> If the light changes its momentum, where does that go? The atom jumps in the other direction. So those are the two kinds of forces we can utilize. So that has a very different shape to the scattering force. So okay, we can make atoms cold. Uh, what can we do with them once they are cold? So um, you've heard quite a bit about ions uh, already this week. They're charged, so it's easy to hold them. Uh, what do we do with atoms, because they're neutral, <coughs> how do we hold them once they're cold? So we can't use their charge because they don't have one, so we use dipole potentials. And there are two electromagnetic dipole potentials. There's the magnetic dipole potential and the electric dipole potential. But the idea is we can make some kind of trap, and relative to room temperature energies, these traps aren't actually that strong at all. However, because we've reduced the kinetic energy of the atoms by six orders of magnitude, we can trap cold atoms <coughs> into these modest potentials. So that's so it's this set statement, essentially. That's why I would say laser cooling has actually revolutionized atomic physics. It isn't the fact that they're slow and that we've eliminated the Doppler effect. It's the fact that they're actually very, very low energy. And as a consequence, we can learn them. <coughs> So I'll tell you quite a bit about this in the second lecture. It's a bit about the electric dipole and uh, this one. So just a summary of what will come later. So uh, most of the atoms we're interested in are paramagnetic, which means they've got one free electron, which means they're like little bar magnets. So you can orientate a bar magnet in the magnetic field, and then the interaction is minus mu dot b. So if you make a bowl of the magnetic field in space, then the atom will experience that as a potential, and then low field seeking atoms will uh, oscillate around this balloon. So that's a trap for cold atoms. As I said, the depth of that thing, if you try to convey it in kinetic energy, uh, is nothing compared to room temperature atoms, but it's sufficient to hold physical atoms. And how can I hold atoms with lizard fields? So uh, I'm going to use electric so unlike the bar magnet picture, this is minus mu dot b. That's linear in the magnetic moment and linear in the field. Atoms don't have a permanent electric dipole moment. So the first thing you have to do is add an electric field. Then that induces a dipole moment. And then that dipole moment reacts back on the beam. So that's why it's quadratic. So it goes as minus half alpha, which is the polarized ability. And e is the electric field squared. And this is a very, very powerful technique because uh, if you detune lead from resonance, polarizability is always positive. So this means that E 
squared is clearly always positive. So this is like a trap. So this <coughs> is a bubble loop. Where the electric field is largest, that's where the atom light interaction is strongest. So what I'm trying to show um, pictorially in this cartoon is this is a surface of a Gaussian beam being focused down to a tight focus and then diverging with at the focus. The electric field is clearly large. So the polarizability that reacts with the electric field, and I get a very deep relative to code up in terms of track. So I might get half a millikelvin, which is pathetic compared to room temperature atoms, but if I can cool my atoms to 10 microkelvin, then you can imagine loading them into the bottom of this track, and then they'll hover around that. So, yeah, the force is feeble. <coughs> So how do we manipulate atoms using laser beams? Well, there's a whole host of geometries. Uh, I've already mentioned this idea that for the dipole force, you need two different momenta. And one of the easiest ways to uh, make that force large is to have equal and opposite momenta, so that I can borrow a photon from here, put another one into that field, and get a large momentum change. So if I counter-propagate two laser beams, and get this beautiful interference pattern, uh, this is known as an optical lattice because we get planes where uh, the intensity is high, low, high, low, high, low, etc. And then the atoms live uh, in the regions where the electric field uh, is largest. It's also worth pointing out that this dipole potential, so I've explained it at some sort of quantum mm -hmm. level in terms of photons. You can explain the whole thing without ever mentioning photons. Uh, and there's another community of people who do experiments on these little beads. And they call this device an optical tweezer. So sometimes we call them optical tweezers in atomic physics. Uh, and it's incredible that you can do these experiments where uh, you can pick up a little ball and move it around, essentially. Uh, and all you have to do to consider that is um, think of um, ray optics. So if you have some sort of Gaussian laser beam, you might do light from the center being refracted and it ends up going in this direction. So to conserve momentum, the atom has to head off in that direction. So if I uh, center my laser beam on my particle, these momenta are clearly the same, so nothing happens. Whereas if I displace my particle to the left, I actually get a force that pulls it back to the right. So that means uh, particle moves in the direction of the gradient of the intensity. And that you can explain without ever needing h-bar or photons, just in terms of rays. And, um, uh, conservation of momentum, essentially from refraction. So clearly we're going to have these little beads, they're going to be macroscopic. They actually need to be roughly the same size as the focus of your laser beam. Uh, we're clearly going to be concentrating on atoms, um, where it doesn't rely on the physical size of the atom it relies on the fact that you can induce a dipole in the atom. So as soon as this field was invented, which was more, maybe 30 years ago or now, there were some fantastic experiments where uh, some biologists managed to stick some of these beads onto an end of a DNA molecule. And then with their tweezer, they could pull, basically grab the ball at the end of the molecule, pull this string of DNA, let it go, and watch this thing was it. And I remember going to talks at the time. Uh, so Steve Chu, who's now, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for doing laser cooling, and is in fact the energy secretary for the US. Uh, he came to Oxford uh, when I was there doing my uh, DPhil. And, <coughs> and there were quite a few biologists in the talk. And the audience was split into two camps somehow. The biologists, who thought it was incredible that you could pick up little balls with lasers and move them around. Uh, and the physicists, who thought it was incredible that you can glue a little ball to the end of a DNA model. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's why biophysics is still sort of a, an emerging field, because people basically are, are pretty much off on their worldviews, and finding an overlap is actually um, very hard. Uh, so this beast, back to the uh, lasers as well, <coughs> is the most powerful laser we have in our research group. So it's a 100 watt carbon dioxide laser. Uh, let's this, one. this on the right uh, is a furnace brick. Uh, 
which as its name implies is designed to withstand incredibly high heat. So there's a fairly obvious experiment. What happens <laughs> when you shine your most powerful laser at the furnace brick? So instant vaporization is actually this experiment of what we've done for the Pokemon. But you, you genuinely need these furnace bricks in the lab to stop the laser. Because we're going to do something more exciting with this laser in a second. But where does it go? You can't just let it stop against the wall, otherwise it slowly drills this way. <laughs> so why would we have a hundred watt carbon dioxide laser? Well, for melting things, that's one of the things. The carbon dioxide laser has uh, a wavelength of uh, 10 microns. So we typically use um, rubidium atoms. Whose resonant wavelength is uh, 780 nanometers. So now we're going to talk about using these lasers far from resonance in order to utilize the dipole. So there's a scattering force, which <coughs> is associated with a Lorentzian. And this goes as one over the difference between the laser frequency <coughs> and the atomic frequency squared. So this is this squared power dependence of Lorentzian. This laser has a frequency uh, wavelength of 10 In other words, I need 13 of these to be on resonance. So when I say far from resonance, essentially you ask, if I come all the way down on this curve, so that I'm 13 times off resonance, how much absorption is there? And well, it's not technically zero, but it's so unfeasibly small that if you shine this laser through some uh, rubidium, there is no scattering. There is no absorption. The light goes straight through. However, the other force, which has got uh, the dispersion, light chip, only goes down as flat, not squared. So it still falls off like crazy. So when my photon is 13 times too small in energy, this is not large. However, it's falling off much, much, much slower than. So as a consequence, as this laser goes through my atoms, it polarizes them. If I focus this laser, where will the atoms go towards the center? So schematically, so we've now focused down this 100 watt CO2 laser to a little waste that's about 10 microns or 20 microns, so it's incredibly intense at the center. This is a movie that I'm about to run, so false color, but real data. So the little cloud you see is about a million rubidium atoms at about 10 microkelvin. This line comes from the CO2 laser coming in at essentially 45 degrees from the top left and going out gravity acts vertically downwards. So we turn off the laser cooling, so what do we expect? Most of these atoms are outside this laser beam, so they'll fall. However, some of the atoms will now live at the bottom of this trap. This trap is about 200 microkelvin deep. Because the atoms are at about 10 <coughs> microkelvin, they then should live at this. So it's very, very counterintuitive at the most intense part of this very powerful laser, you'd expect the atoms to be boiled, and it's exactly the opposite. That's what they lead on. So let's see if that runs. Okay, so that's atoms falling with the gravity, which isn't terribly exciting. This is more exciting, which is atoms hovering around. If you look at the time scale, okay, uh, that went for tens of milliseconds, which is the time you need for atoms to fall through a few centimeters, but the atoms are still there 20, 30 seconds later. So why aren't they falling under gravity? Because they're held up in this incredibly strong laser beam. 
So there's two time scales there. So, so we start at 10, 20, 30 milliseconds, which is Athens falling, and then it switches to much longer, which is Athens hovering. Okay, so that's gravity. And then we jump to a second later, five seconds, 10 seconds, 20, 30. Clearly they are going away because we don't have a perfect vacuum. But it dramatically demonstrates this effect that you can hold atoms with a laser beam that is way off resonance without introducing extra heat. So it's a tweezer essentially for us. So this brings me uh, to this theme of the day. Take an atom. So as I said, when I was an undergraduate, we sort of discussed these things very, very briefly, typically in the last lecture of the 30 lecture course, and there was half a chapter at the end of the lecture about this. Uh, the EPR paradox, quantum and quantum, quantum jumps, all of these things, and many of them, uh, you read about them, and they start with a statement, well, let's take an atom, and maybe take another one, and bring them together, and then move them apart, and look at it as correlations in their momentum. But all of these things relied on being able to take an atom. Uh, and these were thought experiments then, because uh, it was actually just impossible to do it, whereas now we can do it. So that's one thing I really want to emphasize, we're now actually doing these experiments, which is why all of these things have moved up the agenda of uh, lecture courses and textbooks. So it's always useful to see um, what clever people from the past had to say about this. So that's short enough. Uh, this is using this white image phase. So he wrote a paper called, Are There Quantum Jumps? Um, in 1952. If this was his blog, you know, this would be a block capital letters. This is essentially a rant more than a scientific paper. It's worth digging out just to read what I've seen before. And Schrodinger said this, we never experiment with just one electron or atom or molecule. In thought experiments, we sometimes do. This invariably entails ridiculous consequences. In the first place, it is fair to state that we are not experimenting with single particles any more than we can raise ichthyosaura in the zoo. So there's, a, well, there's, there's an interesting quantum mechanics at the top, but the obvious question is, what's an ichthyosaurus? Does an ichthyosaurus look like Danny? I do. Good, correct. <laughs> so they're ichthyosauri. They, they don't exist anymore. Uh, nature abhors a vacuum, but I think nature abhors creatures that are essentially one of a root to dolphin plus chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they're long since gone. Uh, so that's Schrodinger. Next time you use his equation, bear in mind uh, he thought we couldn't do experiments on one electron, one atom, one molecule, one anything in fact. So now we're going through a. IBM did this experiment as soon as they devised their scanning tunneling microscope. So this is IBM having spelled out IBM with individual atoms put on a substrate, and then they've scanned their mm -hmm. tunneling microscope across it. Clearly it's effectively slow as some kind of device to do an experiment, because you've got to do a scan, then take it out and analyze it, etc. However, it proves the point that um, if you want to image a single atom stuck on a substrate, you can do I mean, personally, I'm not interested in sticking atoms to substrates, because uh, that's condensed matter, and that's dull. <laughs> so, write that down. <laughs> Ions are much more interesting. Would you agree, David? Oh, excellent. Especially yeah, these. Yeah. These ones from your group. So there's some ions. I'm sure it's told you how wonderful they are, and that they're going to be a future. So if we can clearly image single ions, you can in fact sit in, uh, image single photons from the single ions, which is a sort of the most anti Schrodinger sort of approach you can imagine. Uh, so you've heard about ions, so I don't need to speak more about them. Atoms, that's what I'm going to talk about. So this is uh, data that came out a few years ago. I go from the uh, Angers group in Paris. He has an optical tweezer, <coughs> and he's loaded individual atoms into his tweezer. This is what you see with this fancy camera. So again, two points. This is false color. Uh, and this is limited by the resolution 
uh, of the imaging system. So don't leave the happens in little red squares. But in his experiment, he can clearly see single atoms and moving red. <coughs> so in fact, what the very nice experiment he did was collect fluorescence from a single atom. And then once in a while, the atom might change its state, which is a quantum jump, uh, or be perturbed by something else, and then it goes away. And then it might come back and go away, etc. So clearly, we can, and in fact, if you look at the distribution, if you've been in these times, you get nice exponential decays, etc. So exponential decay is a property of an ensemble. Short in the talk, we could only ever discuss ensembles, but this is a classic data set showing that's nonsense. You can see and manipulate individual atoms with a time scale that's commensurate with your experiment. So we can see single atoms in a trial. Uh, so I borrowed this slide from the um, Cambridge group. Uh, the vision of a quantum computer, so with three bits classically you could represent any of the numbers between 0 and 7. In a quantum computer, wouldn't it be nice if we could simultaneously uh, store all of that information? And then we're going to build some quantum processor and process all of those in some massive parallel way and then have all the answers at once. And this goes up to 2 to the n. And n doesn't have to be very large for 2 to the n to be astronomically large. Uh, and then we might have an array of atoms, which will be our qubits. And then they move along in time. You might want to do Rabi rotation and some of them pairs of hits between others. Uh, and then you look at what comes out. So this is a classic example of let's take an atom. So what we need here is some kind of array with these atoms loaded into them such that we can move them along and manipulate them. Which is why uh, trapping atoms is extensively being studied uh, in this context. So I've already told you if you focus uh, an intense but far from resonance laser, you can trap atoms there. So it's known as a far off resonance trap. It uses the dipole force. The dipole force doesn't have spontaneous emission, so it's conservative, so the atoms don't get heated. It's associated with a gradient of intensity. Where is the gradient largest? At the focus. That's why the atoms get sucked into the focus. So you can also imagine having some optical device that makes arrays of focus laser beams. You can focus these then to roughly the size of a wavelength. So now we're starting to imagine having some kind of architecture where there are atoms sufficiently close together that you might then be able to do some of these thought experiments. Uh, and in the last um, seven minutes for the first presentation, I'll just tell you about one aspect of this that we're particularly interested in Durham, which is to use something that is a rootable carotid to try and um, build a quantum gate. So um, what's Rittenberg and what's block gate? So the idea of these quantum simulators is you need single site addressability. Not only do you have to have your atoms in your array, you need to actually be able to see them. And you also need the atoms in neighboring points to be brought close together to interact, to build up some mutual phase and then separate them. So the single site addressability has essentially been solved. It was a technical problem and there are lots of um, mostly German groups. So this is a picture taken from this nature paper from last year. Uh, from the group of Emmanuel Block and Kaur, who's moved to the structural in fact, where they have a nice regular array, an optical lattice, in which they can load their atoms. And they also have another laser beam which they can focus to a waist that's smaller than the gap between these atoms. And they have an incredibly impressive optical system for imaging this. They can shine in some microwaves, and then they can manipulate the state of these atoms. So you can write lines, you can then blow away some of the atoms in the line, move those things around, you can write sound, etc. So that's fantastic. So the single sound addressability uh, is essentially now solved. The question is, how do we get these atoms to interact strongly? So uh, David Poggy told you, ions are great because they're charged, and as a consequence, they interact strongly. And atoms aren't charged, and as a consequence, they don't interact strongly at all. So that's an issue. So how might we get around that? And uh, one theme that's being pursued particularly um, vigorously is this idea of using Rydberg atoms. So let me just tell you quickly about that. So rubidium is our favorite atom. So we typically live in the 5s grand state. Occasionally we promote to 5p, and then it goes 6, 7, 8, 9, all the way up. 
So now we often do experiments much higher in this ladder, around 60. So uh, Rydberg state is an atom which has a high principal quantum number. What's special about these things? So as the principal quantum number goes up, many of the properties of Rydberg atoms are extreme. So their size, so if you calculate the expectation value of their radius, this goes as uh, the principal quantum number squared which means that a hydrogen atom is uh, 10 for the nanometer. And the atoms we use can be uh, as large as a micron. So it is somehow incredible that you can make a single atom that's basically the same size as a red blood cell. Uh, their lifetime goes up, which is great, so they live for a very long time. Their polarizability, which tells you how um, they interact with electric field, goes as the principal quantum number to the seven. And the interaction between pairs of atoms which is actually what you're interested in in making some kind of protocol for a quantum gate, that can scale as n to the 11. And given that n can now be numbers between 50 and 100, n to the 11 is clearly a huge scaling in your table. All of those things coming from the fact that uh, this is the sort of textbook picture from wave functions. This is 50p, which is uh, all the right number of nodes if you correct them. This is the uh, probability distribution radially. And it peaks at uh, 2n squared over there. The expectation value goes as n squared. So these atoms really do look like dipoles. They look like a nucleus, and the electron is a very long distance away. That's why their dipole-dipole interactions are going to be ginormous, because they really are, although they're still neutral, they really do look like microscopically separated charges. So this is a slide I borrowed from uh, my colleague Max Jones at Durham, who's doing experiments on strontium Rydberg atoms. So I'm now plotting the interaction between pairs of atoms as a function of how far apart they are. So we've seen that we can trap atoms at typically a handful of microns. Two ground state strontium atoms essentially only interact through this really weak kind of atom interaction, which is pathetically small. So this in hertz is 10 to the minus 5, which means you'd have to wait 100,000 seconds if you put two strontium atoms on top of each other before they built up a phase difference of pi, which is obvious. Uh, so why don't we go to ions? Ions live right at the top of my graph. So the Coulomb interaction is 1 over R, and that's clearly um, ginormously enhanced. The one disadvantage of using ions is not only do they interact strongly with each other, but they interact strongly with absolutely everything else. So the idea that's being pursued in atomic physics is this. You excite your Rydberg state, you gain 19 orders of magnitude, not a factor of 19, 19 orders of magnitude in interaction. So now you don't have to wait very long at all for Rydberg atoms to communicate, pick up a phase change of pi. And the laser you use to excite the Rydberg states, you can then push them back down to the ground state. So this is the idea you have a transient interaction, that's ginormous, but then you can turn it off, go back to ground states. Ground states don't interact with each other or the environment that strongly, which means we might be able to control uh, decoherent properties. Why does it change from 1 over R6 to 1 over R cube? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, very good question. Uh, so the simple picture is of uh, the charge displaced. So here's a nucleus, here's an electron that looks like a dipole. And then I have another atom over here, and that's also a dipole. And the field from one goes as one of our cubed, gets to the other, and that interacts as P dot P. So that's a, that's a very uh, classical picture. When, when they're further apart, you essentially have to wait for, so you don't actually have a nucleus and an electron, because the electron could be here or here or there. You're actually waiting for fluctuations in these charge distributions. And they essentially need to propagate over to the other one to induce a field there that then propagates back. And the question is, is that interaction stronger than some internal energy level? And when you bring them very close together, that interaction is the dominant one, so they really do look like dipoles, two dipoles, like two bar magnets next to each other. Whereas, so there's a kink in the curve, because when you go past some critical radius, actually you, you then go back to this dispersive force. So you've got to wait for this thing to sort of induce the field over here, and then that induced field then goes back. And 
one field goes as one over r cubed, and the other one goes as another one over r cubed. So somehow, my, yeah, my cartoon picture of a Rydberg atom is a cartoon, and the actual subtleties of interactions between Rydbergs, um, yeah, is more accurate. There's a really nice review of using Rydbergs uh, for uh, quantum information by Mark Safman uh, in the review of modern physics. So if you want more details of where that comes in, uh, that's the best place. So what's the dipole block is? that I mentioned. Uh, so this is a fairly simple concept and again not illustrated with a cartoon. So this is separation between atoms. So I start with ground space and I want to get a root boost. If the atoms are very far apart, they essentially ignore each other. So the sequence is one of these atoms can absorb a photon and turn into a root boost. So then I've got the energy of one ground state with a root Then the second one can absorb a photon and now I've lost two Rydberg excitations. What happens if these atoms are closer together so I minimize their separation? That's what happens. So the first step is allowed. So I can go from two ground states to one Rydberg excitation. Because these Rydbergs are interacting like crazy, the second step is then off resonant. have two Rydberg excitations. So I only have one excitation per pair if I'm within some critical radius known as a blockade radius. So if I'm within that radius, you can only make what states with single excitation. And you might ask, well, so maybe I make states where the left one's excited and the right one, sorry, the left one's a ground and the right one's excited because I've gone there. Or I might make states where the right one is excited and the left isn't. And maybe I just don't know. And actually life is much more interesting than that, so I guess you'd be exactly wrong. It isn't that we don't know, um, we can't know. So the state you make is in fact... separated are entangled, and entanglement is the resource we need for driving these forms of data. The blockade mechanism is crucial. It's what actually generates entangled states. And once we have entangled states, we can imagine making some kind of gate. So some experiments started in this a few years ago. So here's the taken atom. So I have one laser beam, I focus it down and trap an atom. I have another laser beam, I focus it down and trap another atom. So this is my exact scenario of taken atom. I've now taken two atoms. I want to bring them close together so they need to interact. I can then look at them individually. If they're further apart than the critical distance, I get two excitations. If they're within this pocket radius, I would only get one excitation. So there can only be one excitation, but I don't know which atom is excited. It's not that I don't know, it's like you can't know. It's a um, entangled state. Um, yeah, so the presence of one atom stops the excitation. That's the blockade part. So a group did this experiment where you look at, these are the pictures of the atoms built up by taking many statistical pictures. You see that they're very, very tightly compacted radially. Those atoms are typically within 10 microns. You can make the blockade radius larger than that. And how do I make a quantum gate? So for a quantum gate, I need a logical statement. And the logical statement is uh, seen in this energy level. If I start in one, then I make a Rydberg state. If one of them is in a Rydberg state, the other can't go into a Rydberg state, so something happens. Whereas if I started at zero, my excitation would be off resonant, and then both atoms could be excited and then they could get. So the fact that the truth table depends on which state the atom starts in 
means there's an if statement, and if you have an if statement, that essentially means you've got logic, and this is going to be quantum logic, uh, which would essentially allow us to build into new devices. So another group in France also saw exactly the same thing. Uh, they saw that you uh, made this sign plus state, as I called it there. And because two atoms are involved in the excitation, uh, you really can't think of them as individual atoms. There's this you know, bizarre lack of separability. Uh, so in fact, individually, these rates would go at a rapid frequency, capital omega. When you make this state, you actually get there root two faster. But the state you get to, you can't think of as an atom in a state and another atom in a state. You have to think of it as an entangled pair of atoms. Uh, they rotate themselves in the constant. So, uh, laser cooling. So, yeah, you've seen this before. The key thing to remember is it's now routine. So if you want an experiment and have some atoms at microkelvin temperatures, well, there are underground labs that allow you to do that, so it's not that hard. Uh, if you focus a laser beam, would be phenomenally intense. But if you're far from residence, at the focus, you have a tweezer. So you can pick up an atom and start moving it around. Ground state atoms don't interact that strongly, however, Rydberg atoms do. The pairs of Rydberg atoms have this blockade mechanism, uh, which allows you to make these large, uncontrollable interactions uh, among different atoms. Uh, yep, okay, right. Uh, 